Yeah, uh, hi, I'm James. I'm gonna talk about mastering PowerShell modules or how to build great locks. Now, this is a bit of a guinea pig for the summit. Uh, this is the first year they're doing workshops on Mondays, you know, decently high turnout. It's also a bit of a guinea pig for myself. We're gonna kind of get back to that in a couple of slides but before we get into more personal disclaimers, the sponsors. We got Patch My PC, we got Chocolatey, we want a special thank out to Pure Storage, Manning, Data On, Script Runner, and PDQ. Thank you for helping us make the summit happen. And, you know. <laughs> having thanked the people to, that pay the bills, let's talk about, you know, who the hell am I? So I'm James from Start Automating. Uh, there's a number of ways I could tell my story, but we're going for the short version here because it's a long talk. Long, long ago, I helped build PowerShell 2 and 3. Um, I was on the PowerShell team. I tested uh, the vast majority of the scripting features you use every day and tried to make them not suck. I hope I succeeded. I'm sorry where I didn't. Uh, Ever since about 2010, I have been a PowerShell-centric consultant. That is to say, most of the work that I do is PowerShell or revolves around PowerShell or utilizes PowerShell. I do program in more other languages, I promise, but you're not actually here to learn about those today, I think. You know, and we only have three hours. When you say it like that. <laughs> Uh, I build a lot of modules and manage a number of GitHub projects um, at last count. Uh, let's, let's see if, ooh, am I connected to the internet? Of course not. Might want to fix that real quick. You know, I'm just going to charge on for a bit because I won't actually need it for 99% of the talk. Um, PowerShell gallery at last count personally is 57. On GitHub, I have, I think, 67 repositories out there now. Um, most of the modules that I build are available as GitHub Actions and Workflows, or as GitHub Actions as well. Um, and most of the technology that I build is used to kind of help push PowerShell further. I write a lot of code. Uh, I handwrite uh, between you know a tenth of a megabyte to a megabyte of code a year. Uh, and my bots write between a gig and three gigs a year. So at least I'm not doing all that. Um, probably will eventually need internet to show some of this, but we'll you know, power through. So I write a lot of PowerShell. And today I'm here to teach you as many tricks as I can in a relatively short period of time. And also to kind of talk through a lot of things conceptually in terms of how you think about your PowerShell modules and your scripts. So, rec personal disclaimers. First, this presentation is my opinion. You know, I didn't have time for the Lebowski slide here, but just, just one man's opinion. Don't take it too harshly or too prescriptively. Treat it with as many grains of salt as you'd like. You know, I don't think that any of us are best served by trying to fight over the perfect ideal way to do something, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And this one might be a little controversial or disappointing for you, considering you know, you're all here to see me talk about mastering making modules, but you know, I may or may not be a true master of PowerShell. The fact of the matter is you can never know, for if you are wise enough, you know that you know nothing. Nobody knows everything myself included, and we are always learning. So let's get ready to learn. Pacing and ground rules. Got a lot to cover in a relatively short period of time. Let's try not to rush, but move briskly. We may not finish, and that's okay. There are about 60 slides in here right now. If we don't get through all 60, we will live. If we get through all 60, then you can pepper me with questions and make sure I'm connected to the internet. Questions are encouraged. 
there are no stupid questions. There are also, in fact, no stupid answers. There are just, you know, less than helpful ones. This is a workshop of ideas. If concepts do not compute, say so. This goes for everybody. I really want people to chime up when things do not make sense. And it's not gonna get as deeply technical as it could, but it is going to get technical. And again, if this does not make sense, stop and ask. Due to the light connectivity problems, it might get extra fun when it gets technical too, because when we get to the little workshoppy points, I'm going to go off script with you. You're welcome to pull out a laptop and follow along, but we're just gonna kind of hack our way through it together and learn. On that note, please be respectful. As much as I might have been one in earlier points in my life, nobody really likes super class clowns and nobody likes, you know, hog in the room. So, with that in mind, here's all we're trying to cover today. You ready? First, making modules are basics. Second, talking tooling. What can you use to help make a module? Third, fantastic functions. So far, so alliteratively good. Fourth, pseudotypes. This is where we might start to confuse people a little bit. What the hell is one of those? Fifth, flexible formatting. Sixth, publishing PowerShell. And seventh, if we get to it, scripts as a service. Oh, I'm sorry, seven will be a little bit lighter than I'd like. All right, uh, before we dive in, um, let's kind of get a sense of where everybody's at. Raise your hand if you've used a module. Okay. Raise your hand if you've written a module. Raise your hand if your colleagues have used your module. Raise your hand if you've published a module on Gallery or GitHub. All right. Cool. Raise your hand if you've ever turned a module into something that isn't PowerShell. Okay. Actually, more hands than I expected there. But pretty good gradation. Uh, and I am a little sorry because some of the first part might be recap for you. But it might be a new way to think of things as well. So, starting basic, assuming I think there was at least one hand in here that had not written a module. Maybe. If you were that person, you can raise your hand now. If you've never written a module before. Oh, okay. There we go. So this will be good then. Well, what's a module? Modules are mostly scripts. That's not the only way to think about them. And we're going to come back to each of these points in their own slide here. The other major way that I think about them and I talk about them when I'm training people about PowerShell is modules are building blocks. This is actually a pretty key difference between PowerShell and other languages. Most other languages build executables. In PowerShell, you build blocks. You build things that you can use with other things. Fun way to put it is a module is a toolbox of joy. Oh, here's this name of this module. Now this is this whole class of cool things that I can do fun stuff with. Ooh, it's like Christmas. A more technical nerdy way to think of it is modules or metadata. These are all true. None of these are mutually exclusive. These are all just different ways you might want to be thinking of your modules, and at least different lenses that I view thinking about any given module when I build one. The last one is, well, second to last one is the most corporate. Uh, but it's also the most important in my mind to imbibe. Modules are brands. You have a Coke or a Pepsi. You, you know, use Module Builder or Plaster. Modules are brands. Whether you try to make a good brand or not, they are brands. The name of the module will carry connotations to your user. 
So with that kind of corporate caveat in mind, turning to the fun one, modules are what you make of them. You can build a module that does absolutely anything. Entertainingly, you can also build modules that do nothing. Who here has used Posh? Technically, that's a module that does nothing. Doesn't have any commands to it. Just changes the way PowerShell works. So you can have modules that are nothing more than a directory with metadata. Modules can be anything. Regarding the brands thing, they don't have to be brands you advertise like on the front page of the New York Times or wherever the kids do nowadays. Um, they can also be the way you refer to things internally within a company. You know, uh, I once worked for an incident response group. I built them a toolkit to help them track down what was going on. It was called Gumshoe. Because it's a hell of a lot easier to remember that and talk about that than it is to talk about, well, this security incident response tracking toolkit. Or, I don't know, whatever acronym somebody came up with that week. Not to say that these are bad branding choices. But a module can be whatever you make of it. And as long as you have a good name that encapsulates that, you can make that whatever you'd like. Let's go back to these kind of five major points each in turn. First, modules are mostly scripts. A PSM1 is a script or module script file. I remember when modules, aka packages at the time, were first introduced or previewed to the MVPs at Microsoft, like around version two. And there is a Israeli MVP, Shai Levy, who was trying to wrap his head around it and had this beautiful and painful epiphany. He was looking at a big PSM1 file. It had function, 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 function. Okay. Modules are just frickin' scripts. Yes, Shai, you're right. They are. They are, in fact, a PSM1 is just a script. It is a script that runs ever so slightly differently than your normal PS1, in that you import module it instead of run it directly or dot source it. Technically, a module is pretty close to dot sourcing. The difference is dot sourcing says, I'm going to run this in my scope, and a module says, I'm going to create a scope to run this. So. You know, modules are metadata to the system too. You can put everything here if you want. Um, these are sometimes called module monoliths. This is not my personal preference. It, it sometimes has performance benefits. Well, sometimes is an understatement. If you are writing a module with hundreds of commands, it will make a big difference if you can import it all from a small number of files. But that difference might not actually matter because you probably won't be importing that often. And individually, you're probably not going to be writing hundreds of commands in every module. So the performance trade-off versus the understandability trade-off for me wins. I like modules that are split out into lots of files. They might be recombined into one for performance, but you can put a module on a PSM one Underline, 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 in my personal opinion, you should not, unless you are only doing that for the perf benefit. It is probably better to dot source a bunch of files. And what that is again doing is saying, each of these files run it in my module scope. Import module dot slash my dot PSM one will load the module. Sorry if I'm boring the people that have used lots of modules, but you know, it's good to know. It's also good to understand that when you say .psm1, it will import it without its manifest. It's also painfully good to know that when you ask a module its path, it will tell you it's a PSM1, whether or not there is a PSD1. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I am calm. 
But yeah, that, that's going to burn you every once in a while if you depend on importing a module by the path it tells you because the manifest contains a lot more metadata. And if we just have the PSM one, that's kind of nowhere near all of it. So building blocks, back to this one. Modules are not programs. They are, there are many entry points, not one. If you are building your average you know, C for executable, Node script, Python script, Go application, you have one entry point. If you build a PowerShell module, you're supposed to have many entry points. Every command is a place that somebody could start. So you can use a module to make programs, but it is not a program. You can call a module in a program, but modules are not programs. You will often find that people approach scripting kind of like they're writing programs. They will, they will write a script from the outside in. They'll you know, just clobber together a file they can call and add parameters maybe, or just call it. You, you don't want to do that. You want to break it into parameterized chunks and parameterize as much as you can because you want more useful building blocks that interconnect more effectively. See, modules are building blocks. They're made to be used and reused, and they will be used unexpectedly. Uh, this is actually very important to keep in mind in terms of the customer service side of your branding and modules. I cannot tell you you're using my module the wrong way. You're using the way that it seemed obvious to you. It might not produce the intended effect, and that might be up to me to explain, but if you thought it should be right, maybe I'm the one that should be doing the thinking. You know, again, take with as many grains of salt as you'd like, as I do with a lot of this feedback. Modules are meant to make things easier. Going back to the toolboxes of joy bit, any day you install a module feels like your birthday. The gift ships in mere seconds, and it is the gift that keeps on giving. Ooh, this exists, I can use it, I'm playing with it, it's fun, I can rock PowerShell in whole brand new interesting ways. Does anybody here not get a huge kick out of this whenever they discover a new module? Because I still do, like, you know, it's, it's just kind of look at the joy the world has made. Unboxing a module, you know, you can import any module with import module dash name, name a module dash pass through. You can also have dash force if you want to force a reload. This pass through parameter will return it back to you and I like that because of some fancy side effects you can get from it. Uh, most notably, when you import modules with pass through, you can get a formatted version of the module back. So you can basically use that as a, a loading screen for the module, which is kind of cool. Peeking inside, you can look at all the commands in a module with get command, dash module, name of module, command type, all. Kind of frustrating here, it'll only show you functions by default, but you know, we all got our problems. Functions and commandlets, I'm sorry. Don't forget the commandlets. Um, you can also get member any module. I mean, this might be obvious to you. We are going to keep coming back to this point, but modules are objects too. And they can be extended. And that means that I can make my module do more than on most modules. In fact, more interestingly, um, both Posh and PipeScript, two modules I produce, extend PS module info. So they actually allow any module to have more features. You can extend other people's stuff too. So toolboxes of joy, and you don't have to just have stuff in your box. You can also have stuff that works with other people's boxes. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Look at all these new toys to play with. That's the reaction I have every time I open up a new module. 
That's the, at least the first reaction. The second reaction might be, oh God, what is this going to do? And the third reaction might be, and they wrote it like this. <laughs> and the fourth reaction would be, and they didn't include help. Please include help. Please send help. Uh, getting back to the technical, because uh, we talked about PSM ones before, we're back for the PSD ones, modules or metadata. And a PSD one is a module manifest. It is the source of your metadata. Now, most people do not know this, but it, technically it only needs a module version. You can have a blank PSD one file and put module version equals 0 0.1 in there and then import module that. Congratulations, you've got a module with absolutely nothing in it, but a version and a directory. Now, fun side question. How many people here can creatively see ways to use just a version and a directory? Okay, just hoping for more hands there. But if you think about like, what's a GitHub release? At the end of the day, it's version and a directory. What is basically anything else under the sun that is file system based, if you're lucky, version and directory. If you're unlucky, version zero, zero, baby. Root module is probably the other one you'd want to have, to have a functioning module, although again, they function without them. It maps to the PSM one. So your root module is going to be your, as shyly you put it, frickin' script. So your PSM one might include other files. Uh, we will walk through some of those as we go. You'll need a little bit more metadata to publish, and this is, you know, take out your notes and phone sorts of times if you want to write it down. You need GUID, author, copyright, or company name, copyright, and description. That's it. I have proved with Posh you can actually publish a module without a, like, root module or without actual commands in it. It just, just needs the data. You want more metadata to extend, though. Uh, types to process and formats to process are especially useful. We're going to come back to them much later, but they correspond to the extended types and extended formatting related to a module. Okay? Private data can hold anything. This is actually kind of great here because I want you to stop and think about, well, not PowerShell for a second. I know we're here for PowerShell, but does anybody know enough of Node.js to know what a package JSON is? So in that case, it's not a directory and a version. It's a directory and a manifest. And then that manifest is an open-ended property bag. You can throw anything you want into package.json. That has proven very useful for the Node ecosystem over time. Also, package JSONs get a little dirty. I'm sorry. Your PSD ones might also get a little dirtier, more complex over time. Don't sweat it. Private data can hold anything, and it can be used like this sort of thing in other ecosystems. It can basically be used as a way to hold a lot of extra information that isn't core PowerShell supported standard info. However, there are a few special functions that are in there. In private data .ps data, ps data is the official sanctioned data section. You can have tags to describe the tags as you're published on the gallery, a project URI, which will ideally link to your GitHub project. It's really the nice thing to do. Please do that. Please do that. 
license URI, which will ideally link to the license in your GitHub project. If you link to a different license, you might make lawyers nervous. Having this will make lawyers feel much more comfortable. I don't know, uh, raise your hand if you've ever had to fight the battle to allow modules inside of an organization. Sadly, way more hands than I'd expect or hope at this point. But yeah, you, you know what I mean. It, it helps to be able to say, hey, this is the license it's under. You don't have to worry about it because it's MIT. You're never going to get copylefted here. Um, icon URI will change the icon in the PowerShell gallery. And release notes will show your release notes when you find module or ideally in other mediums where you get the metadata or present it like a GitHub release. And again, anything else you like. All right, so double checking a few things before we keep going. On the technical level, do we really get A, that modules are just scripts, and B, that modules are metadata? Cool. And on the conceptual level, do we understand how that at least gives us parity with other programming languages and ecosystems and basically anything else that exists? We can think of almost any package in the form of essentially directory metadata stuff, ideally version. Yay. So back to the corporate side, I'm sorry. Seth Academy said I had to do this. Uh, modules are brands. And a module's worth is an intangible asset. Reason I'm kind of giving you this terminology is to help in your performance reviews or whatever company you have, because whether you're creating an internal or external module, having some of the business vernacular around this to get it right will help. Uh, and understanding what these things mean will help. Being an intangible asset effectively means that you can't put a direct value on it that easily. You have effectively a reputational value, okay? It will have a reputation even if it is internal. If you ever get to the point where people are like, this is Bob's module, you've lost. I'm sorry. But this is part of why modules are brands. Because you don't want it to be Bob's module because then only Bob can work on that module and do we really need that module or Bob? Or do we need incident response? Do we need to investigate incident response? Well, I guess we'll always need a gumshoe. Modules are brands. Being brands helps insulate a lot of the way that Modules are discussed in a corporate environment. But that's not all they do. It also invites judgment. Yeah, I'm being a little sarcastic, truly true here, but you know, sorry for human nature. If you have a brand that fits or doesn't fit, people will judge you for it. If uh, you have a module that works well, people will judge that module. And I, I misspoke a little bit earlier before. It's not that they will judge you because modules are brands. They will judge the module. So if you have a module that isn't getting uptick, sometimes renaming can help. If you have a module that has a really great reputation, that will help. Get nitpicky on names. Does it fit or not? Is it memorable, AKA sticky? Okay, pop quiz. What was the incident, incident response module? Cool, you wanna know how long ago I worked on that? Seven years ago. Only for like three months, but a good name sticks, right? Uh, this helps implant it in other people's minds done correctly and convey what it is. Easy is important. A happy scripter is a happy customer. And functional and fun are good goals. 
If it works, it works. And if it's fun slash funny, it's memorable. Uh, there's a few more points I kind of wanted to cover, but I don't uh, have on the slide here for brands. And the, the major one is that by thinking through branding of your module, what you're effectively doing is mentally drawing the size of your toolbox of joy. So if I want to give you a gift, all right, if I'm giving you a big gift, it's gonna take a big amount of time, small gift, it's gonna take a small amount of time. Amorphous concept, you're more likely to be disappointed. Specific thing, you're more likely to be hopefully happy, at least getting a binary version of that, right? But this is a tricky art form. Nobody gets it perfect. I mean. Fortune 500 companies pay lots of money to figure out marketing and still fail, and so will we all. Uh, 57 modules does not equal 57 successful brands, nor do I have the secret here yet, anything close to it. Uh, but having that distance between you is very good, and having that demarking line around the concept is actually very helpful too. Let's go back to Gumshoe for a second. If somebody said, that's great, I want this to go ahead and, I don't know, connect to a Roku and show statistics in there. Is that gumshoe? No. It's so far outside of the box that you set with that brand, mentally, that it's very easy to have the discussion, this is out of scope. So be very careful in how you're drawing these boxes, internally or externally, because they're the promise you're making. Tuesday, I might get laughed at. I'm giving a talk, Rocking Doctor with PowerShell. I've got a new module out, it's called Rocker. I think it's pretty cool. Note that that's what the brand's probably trying to convey too, right? Also, there's a bit of doctor reassociation. Here's the thing, and here's the rub. If you guys all think it sucks, is that name gonna come back to bite me? So these are gambles. And they're complicated strategic calculus. On the same example, while Rocker is initially related to Docker, can I expand that box a little bit into rocking other applications, like intercepting them and parsing their output? Could I contract that box into making a music player if I wanted to, or completely reformat? So just because they are brands does not mean they are fixed. They are where you're kind of mentally demarking it, but it can change over time. The only last bit to remember here, it's of just famous maxims through time. Rebranding is expensive. You want to rebrand your module, great. So I referenced that module name 576 times in 35 different files. I'm going to find and replace for a while here. I might use some scripts. But yeah, rebranding is expensive. Even if you can rapidly rename the files, I am still having, oh, this tool is called that now. Or this tool has basically been retired in favor of that tool now conversations. For that matter, as far as the branding personal difference, I couldn't count the number of times I've had a colleague at an engagement, hey man, I found this cool module. Yeah, yeah, I wrote that. Like eight years ago, do you look at the metadata? But cool, thank you for showing me it, I'm glad you like it. So there, it just does create this distance from you that can be helpful. You know, you still probably wanna put it on your resume though. Uh, this takes us to the end of the most high level section of just what the hell is a module anyway. Do we all feel like we understand that at least a little bit differently than when we walked in the door, except for maybe Joel, who is extraordinarily brilliant and will learn nothing from today. Sorry, uh, pick on a particular person. But anyway, does everybody feel like they've gained a bit? Think through their module making more than just like, uh, I guess I'm gonna name it Bob's tool set. That's never gonna cause a problem for me ever. 
Uh, there are some important module epiphanies that I want you to kind of keep coming back to. One, module metadata is open-ended. There is no limit to the information you can include within a module. I mean, if you don't want to put it in the manifest, you can put it in a file. Modules, just directory plus metadata, right? Just put it in private data, I don't care. The other one is modules or objects too. And we already touched on this a bit, that they can be formatted and extended, and they can be thought of as property bags. Now, this next one's gonna get real nerdy for a second, and I'm sorry, uh, especially for the lack of lead in here, because we didn't exactly cover it in our not nitty gritty portion. Modules are singletons. Raise your hand if you know what the hell a singleton is. I'm borderline impressed, okay? Like a, a tenth of the room. Um, a singleton you can think of as Highlander rules. There could be only one instance. Uh, so when you import module, there can be only one module of that module in memory at a given time. That means if you alter the data attached to the module or keep data with the module, it's very fast because unlike most objects where you have to go basically look for where they could be dynamically defined in a number of places with getting modules, you just literally get module, get a list of singletons back. Each of these singletons is a reloaded specific instance of that module as it exists in memory right now. It will be the exact same object you ask for no matter how many times you ask until you reload. So modules are singletons is great because it takes that modules are metadata epiphany and it lets you use it very, very quickly. Every piece of information you have in a module is so rapidly accessible because the pointer to the module never changes. And again, a module can be anything or include anything. All good? Maybe, hopefully. Um, who feels like pausing for a second here and trying to make a really, really dumb basic PSM1, PSD1 on nothing? Okay. Uh, you want me to do this or you guys want to do this? <laughs> Why did I ask a volunteer? All right. Here we go. Off books, rapid demo time. Think I'm gonna have to use Visual Studio Code though because I did not change my color scheme on terminal and it is awful. And you'll have to give me a second. So you want one from scratch or do you wanna look at existing ones or both? Okay. No, and I will get into that in a second, actually. <laughs> See, and Joel, why is Joel here is just chuckling in advance. Do you want to take this one, buddy? <laughs> Do, raise your hand, or your hand, if you knew, mo knew, knew that new module manifest exists. Cool. Also, who knew that would be an unexpected tongue twister? Um, raise your hand if you've used new module manifest. Raise your hand if you would ever use new module manifest again. I use it all the time. I just delete it and have to file That's just wasteful, buddy. Yeah. Also, that's the shirt I was meaning to wear. I just forgot to change into it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah.
yeah, I actually have a few different versions and I was going to wear more faded ones each day. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, let's go take an existing VS Code instance here. Try not to strain my neck too much. Make directory foo, um, foo bar module, if I haven't already made it. Okay, first, oh, this is gonna hurt my neck so much. Um, I'll work with it. Okay, so we're going to make a basic PSD one here. Prove the point number one, module version. I can type, maybe, 0 0.1. I am not going to do this for every demo. Uh, definitely not. I'm just setting an expectation now. Foo, bar, module. And yeah, discretion is the better part of Valor. Uh, one, go open up that. Two, do not spill my own soda. Three, stop craning my bloody neck. Four, hope my PowerPoint stays at the right spot. Okay. Five, open up a new code instance because that's what I always need, is just another code instance. Uh, okay. Fine, we're doing this again from scratch, I don't care. <sighs> there we are. New directory here. Go open up VS Code in the new directory so we can get a nicer file system there. Nice empty directory. Good empty directory. Go create me a new file, please. And we're going to just say module version is 0 0.1. Prove that point first. No, I don't want to make G's. There. You know, ironically, I build a show demo module, and if this were a pre-baked demo, I wouldn't have to type any of this crap. <laughs> Just, okay, so first, yes, I can import it. Proving the point, yay, cool. Now, why don't we like new module manifest? Uh, again, too much. Well, I have to give it a path first. You know what, forget it. Um, the short version is new module manifest populates too much. If you pass the parameters the wrong way, it creates a manifest that exports nothing. And I would rather write that shit by hand, forgive my language, than I would ever have it screw me by accident. Hey, at least we kept it PG-13 for now. Um, adding more to this. We're going to go ahead and add our root module here. And we're going to say that is foo bar module dot PSM one. Now this is convention. Please do this. Have your PSD one and PSM one name the same, but it, it doesn't have to be this. So going to import. Okay, there's no PSM one there. That's fine. I guess I can kind of broach this topic here for a second, although it's kind of jumping ahead and not really greatly covered, but you don't actually have to use verb noun pairs in a module either. There, now we're at a module. So that was like a minute sidetrack <laughs> with like a chiropractic appointment in my future and uh, I don't know, 
two or three minutes of BS before it. So yeah, modules are really not that hard. Branding, that's hard. Figuring out what you want the box to be, that's hard. The module itself, oh, that's so freaking easy. Like there's there's almost nothing to master there. Remember, if you know how much you know, you know you know nothing. Well, hey, congratulations! I have known nothing and talked for forty five minutes about how modules are just scripts and directories and metadata. And hopefully, you guys all enjoyed it. But at the end of the day. Yeah, making the module I could have literally done nine times, 10 times over in the time that it takes to explain some of the concepts around how you think about modules. And those concepts are much more not technical. You know, they're more like, where do you draw the box? What's good and how do you communicate it? And okay, these are the fields I need. And this is the file name and that's the file name. And okay, we're good. And if we wanted to kind of expand this out a little bit more, I'm gonna get a little jumping ahead here. I'm going to be a little fancy and I'm going to make a PS, PSM1 here. I'm going to cheat. Jumping ahead here. I'm put in the line here include star dash star dot PS1, PS script root. Cool. And I'm going to import this module pipe script. We're going to get back to that in a second, but the short version of it for now is it's a compiler around PowerShell. Remember I said I don't really care if it takes a while to load? Proving that point right now. No, I'll make it load faster shortly. Uh, if I build or export TypeScript this file, it'll first say, hey, I don't know that it's Git because it's going to try to check the validation. But don't worry about that. Bug to fix. Um, it will write a script that will include all of the directories or all the PS1 files underneath there. So instead of having to write my PSM1 by hand or include everything by hand or write this much longer, more specific code, I just get to throw in, okay, basically all of this. And this is every module I write is this or a couple more lines. Because I, all I really want to do is say all star dash star PS1 files underneath that, dot source them and bring them in. And so now I can go ahead and say like, you know, get dash foo dot PS1 and get bar dot PS1. And we can just throw a function in there. Throw another one in there. Reimport my module. All done. I think I didn't save the first file. Now all done. Except for the tab completion fun. There we go. Get foo. Get bar. Again, that's skipping ahead. Uh, it's not too far ahead though, because A, you have now finished with section one. If you feel like you need to wipe a nosebleed away or vomit or use the bathroom, let me know. B, we're about to talk tooling. You just saw me use a little bit of tooling to basically not write my module to take like half of the conceptual pain that I, okay, so it's just a freaking script. And basically all modules, I just want to take other freaking scripts and reload them with dots. So the, the my module script is always the same exact script that does the same exact things, basically, that just goes and grabs a bunch of other files. Yay, cool. On, instead of writing that at the time, each time I decide to use tools to write that for me. Tools are useful. You know, that's kind of literally like their whole 
thing. You could write all of your code by hand. It will take longer. It will work worse. Like even that includes star dash star. You saw that there were some exclusions. There were, there were some exceptions to the rules. There were ways that it processed it with for each versus a for each object. There were scoping concerns that it had thought through that you don't have to. So yeah, you, you can totally write your own thing that'll dot source all the PS1s in your directory. That won't take you that long. I would hope the compiler has thought about that problem space a little bit more. Code written by hand, all else being equal, will break more easily. Uh, if something is pushed through a compiler first, it has a secondary chance to exhibit a failure, like if you just plugged in a bad type name. Um, and it also can add auxiliary information that will help you debug and understand issues when they fail. So it's much better to use tooling to make anything because you're more likely to have a reliable product. Like, uh, raise your hand if you 3D print from time to time. Huh. Would any of us really want, even if we like mastered carving machines, to sit there with a pocket knife and got enough arthritic problems as it is? All right. So. Please don't build stuff all by hand. Um, I don't see Frederick in here, is he? No? Frederick Wyman, who builds PS Framework, uh, is one good person to look to for build or do good tools. Joel Bennett over there builds a lot of good tools. I try to build a lot of good tools too. You do not need to fully understand any of the tools you're using, love the people that build the tools, love the tools themselves, just in any given case, ask yourself, A, is it easier to use this than rebuild this? And B, look, is making this tool part of the box that I'm demarcating? Back to that branding question, you know, is making the part of building massive SVG charts around your incidents part of gumshoe? No, maybe sending the data to something else might be, but yeah. Let your brand help demark what fits in your box or not. And if it doesn't fit in your box, try not to build it by hand. Try to like let tools help. If it does fit in your box and the tool can help you build it, let the tool help. Do not do this to yourself. It takes a village, yada, yada, yada. And as The Simpsons reminds us, please think of the children. And I, I only half joke here because like, I'm not gonna raise my hand for this. Raise, my, raise your hand if you have a family. Raise your hand if you've ever had a conversation with that same family about work going too long and really wished in your heart of hearts that you could not be working anymore. Like, yeah. This is why you use tools. It saves you the time long term, and that time benefits not just you, especially if you have you know, extended family or people that rely on you. It's, it's good for your time. Your time is more valuable than just code. But also think of the customers, you know, because they don't know or care about your children, but they also really care if things do or don't break, are reliable, if things can be fixed easily or not. Use tools. The tools we will use today, and you can install them, module them now if you have a better internet connection than I. Easy out. Raise your hand if I already heard of it. Ouch. Help out. Same, okay. Ouch again, PipeScript. I mean, technically you did all hear of it five minutes ago. <laughs> Posh? Okay, that's an interesting note. PS DevOps. What's fascinating about this is like popularity and downloads wise, that's like 10, 20 times more popular than any of them. 
And also, like, you're all here to see me talking about mastering and making modules. And so far, like, 10% of you even use these modules, though, right? <laughs> PSSVG. Did you raise your hand at that one, Joel? I, I've tried. Oh. <laughs> I, it's not. Oh, I don't, I don't need it either. It's a show of force. <laughs> okay. Um, while you guys try to install module them, if you got your laptops open, I'm going to see if I can get connected to the internet before that presents greater problems. Uh, let's see. What is the Wi-Fi mind bar free Wi-Fi? Yes. All right. Who's got a password for me? That's a it's a wise choice. It's actually just the PSH side. Also, I just realized I'm still on duplicate mode, and I'll switch to the other one in a second. When you said before you weren't connected, I was like, that's because he wasn't here earlier. No, that's because I literally just got here. Okay, so now we have to play like how logged in will I be or will how much various services will freak out. GitHub, not so much. Not logged into that, looks like. Oh, maybe. Okay, um, the main ones that we are going to use are easy out and pipe script. Uh, again, too many slides here. We probably won't make it through it all. I very strongly would doubt we're going to get to like the side rants of Posh and help out and PSSVG. But since pictures speak a thousand words and it's pretty, I am going to briefly show the thing that we just side tracked about. Because this is a PowerShell module too. And we will be coming back to it conceptually a few times. This is a module that wraps the SVG standard. So the SVG standard is a web standard used to produce scalable vector graphics. That means they're much smaller than normal raster graphics and can do cool things. Um, these are all the demos for it. This generates about four megs of code every time it generates. And all of these demos, all combined, are only about 50 kilobytes of actual graphics. So you do have a lot of front end of like, or not front end, back end of, of here we're going to go take everything that exists in SVG and make a command out of it. But the net effect is rich graphical capabilities out of PowerShell that work everywhere that can do beautiful things off of small amounts of input. A module can be anything. So this is the thing that generates the spirals. This is how much code to produce, you know, that kind of beauty. So there are a lot of fun tools to look at. And if you actually want your brand to have a logo, that's why PSSVG exists, aside from the whole, as I put it, show of force of, hey, this thing is programmatically generated and it builds like four megs of code every time. Yeah, it also helps me build logos and be visually consistent across a lot of products by having a way to script my logos. Actually, a really, really great marketing trick. Like, I'm really looking forward to finding an ad agency that actually thinks about these things creatively because, yeah. Anyway. Um, Mainly going to focus on PipeScript and EasyOut. 
each of these tools will help you build modules or makes PowerShell more pleasant. I mean, that, that's kind of just, just install Bosch, it'll, you'll be happier. Tools and trade-offs. Many modules exist. Using them will save you time. You should not reinvent the wheel. Please do not, uh, or as I sometimes put it for Washington audiences, only those that smoke way too much like to roll their own. <laughs> you should think through the consequences. Uh, as much as I am encouraging you to use tools, I'm not encouraging you to use tools blindly. You don't want to just use, you know, Bob's random internet tool. I'm sorry for anybody named Bob in here that I'm accidentally picking on today. Uh, but you don't want to use Bob's random internet tool. You do want to do a little bit of research about the organization or individual that creates the tool in the first place and have some understanding of what it's setting out to do, right? And you especially want to think through how using that tool will impact your development life cycle and the modules you produce. These will likely be minor. Um, you know, again, Fred's not in this particular one, but the big kind of grumble against using a big tool, actually, Joel, you can step to the bat for this one. You're, you're a big fan of requires modules, right? So yeah, you'll build a lot of tools on top of tools on top of tools. And all it really means is you got to install another module first. I prefer to build tools that are more loosely coupled, but I don't always build them that way. Sometimes I will require. Um, today's tool chain is designed to limit that trade-off. So most of the time what I will build in terms of PowerShell tooling is not designed to make you require that module when you use it. You use it to help build other modules, or you just use it as a module, right? But you're not going to build a module that then requires module. But so what if you did? The only time you're gonna get into a big problem here is if Joel supports Ukraine a little too much and decides to throw something into his module that you require that bombs it if you're on a computer in Russia and you live in Russia. Getting my point, you know. So you should think through the trade-offs involved, but don't be afraid of making them because the trade-off that you're generally making is thinking of my customers, thinking of the children, do I want to save time by using tooling or not? So how? By compiling. Better living through compilation. Significant bonus points if you get this very old ref. Uh, every language could use it could use a compiler. Sorry, I have a typo on that one. That includes PowerShell. Compiling can help reduce total code and improve performance. We're going to use two compilers here again and again. Easy out, which you know, despite building a long time ago, I didn't think of a compiler for a long time or as a a compiler for a long time. It, it can be thought of as a compiler for PowerShell format and types files. It markets itself as just helps you write them because the average person who's trying to understand formats and type files probably doesn't really want to understand compilers. But at the end of the day, yeah, this is a compiler for a major portion of PowerShell that's proven very useful over the Holy crap, decades, I feel old. PipeScript will compile PowerShell and anything else. So, you know, that kind of explains why. You've already gotten a little bit of a hint of how this all works, but we're gonna hop back to it for a second since we're still in the screen mode. And what we did with this here, this is your PipeScript file. All you have is a .ps, .ps1 or .ps, .psm1, .ps other extension. And it uses it as a signal. Hey, I'm PipeScript. I'm going to go change this, this file. If it's PowerShell, it does that by changing the AST. So include isn't a real attribute that exists. 
but the PowerShell parser doesn't care, and TypeScript can go look and say, oh, I know what I can do when I see you reference the thing that looks like an attribute that says include, I can replace you with this, which took this tiny piece of information you gave me, the variable you're including, and expanded this out into this. I could write that by hand every time. How many times do you think I'd typo? Like, I don't even know, just in that 11, 10 lines, I'm gonna say at least five. I think I typoed like twice just getting the include written. I am human. These fingers get old. So in that example, if you add a comment in your PS file, that will translate to the uh, variable, one, right? I probably could, you know, talk while answering this, I suppose. Uh, I hope so. We'll find out in a second, won't we? File size changed. Better question here is, does that have a sticky pointer to the same thing or not? It does generally. Oh, so you noticed. This wasn't how you, you might not have saved it. It was no, no, I, See the asterisk right there, buddy. All right, uh, yeah. Also, I wouldn't have made the point if I wasn't confident it would work that way, so thank you. <laughs> Occam's razor can be a little bit cruel sometimes, but it is much more likely that I didn't save the file than the tool stopped magically working. But the demo gods are cruel like that, so, you know, who knows. All right, so as a little example of how tooling helps, does this help? Not that there's not tons more I can go into, but we've only got an hour and a half left, I think, to go through all the rest of the stuff. And we are on slide, I'm gonna be scared. Oh, it doesn't tell me that until I do go back to the screen view. I'll just live with it. I'm gonna say about 20 out of 60. I told you we weren't making through. So, rather than write all the lines again and again and again per module, I prefer to do something like this. Include is by far not the only interesting little compiler in TypeScript. Um, inherit is another one that I use often and that basically says, take this original function, write me a function that uses all that function's parameters, but isn't that function. Yay, handy. Um, going back to this for a second, I think we did just make a mini module. I don't think we overthought it. Did we? Anybody think we overthought it? I thought you were supposed to do this, but this is what I get. It is the first guinea pig workshop we're gonna like note in the experiment. It does not seem that you can corral an interactive coding exercise out of 40 people, half of whom have laptops out. Does not seem possible. But yeah, it was just a PSD one and PSM one, and then after that, as we started to throw in a couple more files, not that much more, just a little file that generated PSD one or PSM one, and oh, look, I did include. But you don't have to. I mean, you really don't. Like, this is a contentious way to develop. Uh, two shows of hands here. Who felt comfortable compiling their scripts when they walked in the door? Okay, probably about what I was expecting there. Who feels at least a little comfortable with the concept now? Now that's progress. There we go. Also, we are not done beating this point in. We're gonna keep coming back, so that might raise. Important tooling epiphanies, aside from we are all tools, but don't be a tool. <laughs> tools are useful, so use them, please. Tools are force 
multipliers. Uh, they let you do more with less. Um, yeah. There was a good old internal PowerShell team, team building presentation thing, whatever, any number of years ago, where a PM by the name of Kenneth Hansen had talked about, you know, the old, if every, uh, if all you have is a problem, every, you know, or a hammer is, every problem is a nail or something like that. I always screw up this adage. But, you know, PowerShell is not just a hammer. It's far beyond that. What's PowerShell? Brings out a nail gun. <laughs> um, switching to building your code with code is akin to like an industrial revolution in your own process. When you are crafting every line of code you write by hand, you're weaving. Great, you're proving your capability as a craftsperson. Great, maybe you're learning and perfecting your craft. Great, are you ever gonna be able to beat the loom? Should you try? Use technology. Also, compilation is cool, improves reliability, and it expands capabilities. Now, ready for some functions? Also, one hour and 10 minutes into a talk about PowerShell, I've only written two functions so far. They were get foo and get bar. I'm just kind of proud of this. This is, by most of the time, I'm like, okay, five minutes in, going to demo mode, there we are in the code. Here, we're just gonna wade through this file. This is good high level right now. Well, we still got a lot of ground to cover. Basic stuff's gonna bore you, I'm sorry. Function form, command line binding, or lack thereof, attributes. Powering up pipelines might start to get interesting. Parameters or property bags might kind of be obvious even just saying it, but you know, it's a good thing to ingest and compiling commands. So we're gonna try to speed through this one because this is probably the least fun, even though it might have some of the more practical tricks. Um, believe it or not, your form of your function makes a huge difference. The shape of your functions ends up being important in a number of ways. To a lesser degree, so is style. Uh, the recommended function form I have is, is basically function, inline help, parameters, in a specific param block, and then a body. Um, very, very quickly, who knows about begin, process, and end name blocks in PowerShell? Yes. I don't have to feel like a schmuck for not covering that here. But yeah, you'll, you'll have name blocks or not, just the keeping it to this format keeps it relatively consistent. Uh, recommended parameter form, and this is again, just one man's opinion here. Parameter attributes first, please spread them out, at least if you can. Um, by spreading them out, I mean if you are declaring them and you have the syntactic option to declare them across multiple lines, please do. If You've written a parameter set longer than 40 or 50 characters. You do not want to also write value from pipeline by property name on that same line. Readability helps. Uh, all other attributes after the parameter attribute, with the exception of the alias, which I like to come right after the parameter, and the type, which I like to be last. It actually doesn't technically matter, I believe. Does anyone know for certain? But I'm pretty certain they can be in about any order. But this helps a little bit, helps in understanding what where where you're gonna see it, and you know, just sort of makes it real more readable. And if you are parsing from an AST perspective, it's see it faster. There are a lot of other faster things you can do in PowerShell than this difference, though. So don't like rake a colleague over the coals. You didn't do this? Don't you know it makes a millisecond of difference? Think of the millisecond. 
Uh, next bit is a personal philosophy. And I encourage people to embrace this. Uh, do not worry. Be alias happy. Aliases are your friends. They're your users' friends, too. To make commandlets friendlier, they make commandlets friendlier to more objects. And you don't want to worry. You want to be alias happy. Let's kind of go back to that in a second when we talk about parameters, but talking about that on a high level with commands first. Who here has at least one colleague or has had at least one colleague that absolutely cannot stand verb noun naming? Aliases can shut them up. Even if it's as simple as that, um, aliases can also provide n number of alternative names to a command itself. So instead of thinking, well, is it search foo or find foo? Why not both? It's literally one line. Like it could be both search and find foo. Command can have any number of aliases, and thus, if you kind of think about it in a cool way, you know, command's not even really a single entry point either. It's as many different entry points as you choose to call it. Kind of. Um, this is especially key, though, when it comes to pipeline parameter binding, which I think is not the next slide, but the one after. So I will come back to, don't worry, be alias happy in a second. Commandlet binding or lack thereof. Um, commandlet binding attributes make a function advanced. This is the technical term. Really, for the, the type of PowerShell functions past v2, they are called advanced functions. Nobody ever quite figured out what we were calling not advanced functions. A lot of names uh, went around over the years. But either commandlet binding or a parameter attribute will make a function advanced. And this will give you error action, preference, you know, debug, verbose, et cetera, all of these automatic parameters in PowerShell. This is great. Um, you might not always want to do that. Uh, you might want a free fu function. You normally want functions to be advanced. Like if you don't have a good answer for this, go ahead, use parameter attributes and strong pipeline binding, it's probably easier. It will give you what if and confirm. All you need to do is say commandlet binding and short support should process. Two parameters for free with one small mouthful. Um, what if preference will tell you if what if was passed. Personal preference here, I love to make commands that return something when what if is passed, instead of just say, what if this happened? When it says, what if this happened, it prints directly to the console. Nobody can avoid it, and it's not really that detailed or helpful. But if you were, hmm? oh, uh, if you were, uh, sorry, if you were trying to return a more advanced object, if you were talking to a RESTful API, uh, or we're about to call a command, what if could return the payload or the URI or arguments, can return more useful information. So love support should process, great fan. Love being able to actually make dash what if return something useful too. And you can do that with a dollar what if preference. It can also give you dash first or skip and supports paging. You can find this with dollar ps commandlet paging parameters. Um, I'm gonna, apparently it's about break time, so I'm gonna get through these, this one and the next one or two if you're all right with it, and then we can all break. You can also select a default parameter set name. Now, you might not want to. It's kind of better, in my opinion, to be able to have the ambiguity between a number of parameter sets than to have a distinct choice. But parameter sets, themselves might be more beyond what somebody needs. You should think about whether you need them or not. 
they are distinct sets of parameters that you can apply to a command. If neither the parameter attribute or the commandlet binding attribute is present, I have started to call this a freeform function. Why? Because we used to call it a dumb function. That was a little bit mean. But the freeform function can be very valuable. I mentioned earlier that tool Rocker. Um, who here is familiar with the tool you get? Okay. You get overrides get and returns its output as objects. That's great. But it has one gotcha from purely commandlet binding that I can't stand. And that's if you pass two dash C flags to git configuration flags, PowerShell thinks you are passing dash confirm twice. And then it tells you you can't do that. So why might I want a freeform function? Because if I have a freeform function, I am stepping away from all of the crap PowerShell's commandlet binding and parameter binding would impose upon me. It's freeform, good and bad. I will lose my nice, rich parameter metadata. I will gain the capability to do literally anything I want. You know. And it looks like we are still a few more slides from coming back to the joy of aliases and being alias happy and parameters. So audience choice, pause here or power through and then pause after this parameter point. All right. I think this is where we were before we were so foodly interrupted. I'm sorry, I watch Bob's Burgers. <laughs> also, I'm sad that Stephen Judd wasn't here to appreciate that one. <sighs> All right. So we covered freeform functions a little bit, why they can be sometimes useful, how they used to be called dumb functions, how command binding can give you a bunch of automatic easy plugs into your function, just to recap what's on the slide. What if and confirm come from support should process. What if preference will tell you if what if was passed so you can reuse it to return nice objects. First and skip will come if you say supports paging and PS commandlet.paging parameters will have what you pass to those things. Quick note, they're gonna come back as longs. You might wanna make the mints. Uh, you can't change the type of the parameter. You might want to coerce it before you cast it to another API. But um, no, I mean canonically, that's a lot harder to get the last end of a thing. You have to know it's done. So if I'm paging through a long-running API. I'm not always going to know it's done. To try to know it's done is actually fairly technically complicated. And that is why, yeah, no last. Select object can give you a last because you're piping a full pipeline into it. But it can give you a last a lot slower than it can give you a first. Um, attributes. Commandlet binding is the one that we've just covered, but it's not the only one. Any script block can have any number of attributes. Now, raise your hand if you already knew that. Okay. Some work to go. Raise your hand if you've used that in practice. About the same hands. Um, PowerShell is great for a number of reasons. One of them is that you can richly attribute about anything. Variables can have attributes. Parameters basically are attributes. You know, in fact, if you're looking at a proper compiled commandlet, a parameter for a proper compiled commandlet is literally a property with an attribute. So, yeah, attributes are already part of power how, how PowerShell works, and they're used pervasively, but they actually are supported almost everywhere. Whereas, if you compare that to, well, let's compare it to C sharp. Lots of attributes in C Sharp only work on a class or a method. Lots of them are very specific and will only work on method X, Y, or Z and will cause errors if they're elsewhere. 
PowerShell doesn't care. A few, like commandlet binding, are automatically honored. PowerShell will say, oh, cool, you have a commandlet binding attribute on a script block. That means if you had supports process, or should process, I'm gonna give you what if and confirm parameters. And it means if I'm gonna, if you support should pay aging, I'm gonna give you, you know, skip and first. Great. But any other .NET attributes are inert in PowerShell. And this is actually very handy, because it basically means you can put this attribute metadata anywhere. It won't actually do anything, but you can do whatever you want with that data. Some PowerShell attributes are also contextually inert. Validate pattern or validate script mean nothing on a script block. On a parameter, they validate a parameter. So if you put a validate pattern on a parameter, it'll ensure that it matches that pattern. If you put a validate script on that parameter, it'll make sure the value matches that script. Great. Imagine I wanted to say, I want to run all of these scripts in a directory, but only the ones that match a rule. What am I really kind of doing here? Whether I'm using validate script or not, I'm taking one list of scripts and I'm using another list of scripts to validate each one. So the fact that these are inert attributes in some parts of PowerShell means that you can do whatever you want with them in those parts. I can use validate pattern and validate script as a determination of validity for a command. And that's like, let it hit you in waves. Let it sink in. You're really used to running every command you run across. You're not necessarily used to the idea that you might want to conditionally run a command. You might not even be thinking about how you'd plug all that together yet. But you don't really have to. Because whenever you decide to do that, you have these two beautiful attributes that ship with PowerShell that even have a nice accelerated syntax. You just validate script, validate pattern, top of a script block or top of a file. And this can be your hint to whatever other script you write, go run this. Let's see how everybody's memory is after a bit of food and go back to our branding problem and what's in the box or not. So if I wanted Gumshoe to be able to kind of export the thing X, Y, or Z, well, the individual things that it exports to aren't really gumshoe. The things that export might be. At the very least, I could put them in the box that is gumshoe, as long as I have a pretty good way of saying, if you're exporting this, go call that. Validate pattern, validate script. So if I have 50 different ways I could run a thing, I can use these attributes to help me decide which of the 50. Is that sort of kind of making sense? I can also just use these four metadata. In fact, I wish I had this one on the slide, but um, reflection.assembly metadata attribute is literally just a key value pair. So you can throw any extra key value pair that you want onto a command or a script block. And to remind you, modules are just freaking scripts, so this works there too. I can have a module which has attributes on itself. They're a little bit harder to get to, but it's a pretty pervasively workable trick. Attributes are wonderful, and you don't have to be limited to the official ways that attributes will be honored in PowerShell. You can either make your own attributes for your own purpose in C-sharp, or just treat other attributes that exist as informative. And there are hundreds of attributes built in. Uh, I have a gist about this if anybody wants it. Uh, keep this in mind, we can bend this to our will, although possibly not with the amount of time we have on the clock. Let's talk pipelining for a second, and now we're gonna come back to being alias happy. 
Who knows about parameter value from pipeline? Cool. That's great. It's the easy way of pipelining. Accept one whole object from the pipeline. This will accept any object of that type from the pipeline. Now, if it doesn't have a type, there will be a couple of binding problems if it is typed to PS object string, Boolean, or anything that anything can convert to. Yeah, you're going to bind everything. So object, PS object, string, Boolean. That, that basically will mean everything will pipe. That might not be what you want. This is where parameter sets could come in handy. This is also where you could just accept something like a PS object as a type and then look at its type later. In PipeScript, the much shorter right way to write this is VFP. This is like literally just a shorthand for parameter value from pipeline with all the other possible attributes of a parameter attribute. But again, I get old. This would be a lot more crackly sounding if I had not stopped typing some of these repetitive bits of BS a couple years ago. Uh, possibly more useful, but way more repetitive, is the parameter value from pipeline my property name. Who knows this, uses it, and loves it? Yay, we are making progress. Also, welcome. You missed your earlier call out. Anyway. Um, value from pipeline by parameter name or property name is awesome. It is useful, but much, much more so painful to type. In TypeScript, this is the much, much shorter VBN. Again, works directly like attribute, just much less knuckle cracking required over time. You almost always want parameters to be value by name. Also, just in terms of saving all of the syllables, can we just all agree as a community to just call this value by name? Because nobody even wants to say value from pipeline by property name. Nor is it actually the most communicative because it is value by name, value by an object with that name. It will bind any property of that name, and this is where we get back to don't worry, be alias happy, because it will bind any alias of that name too. So imagine I want to make a playlist normalizer, because like I'm the only person left that uses MP3s anymore. And I wanted to take all the playlists that I had from iMusic and Zune and make them new playlists, simple M3Us. Oh, also my old, old, my old M3Us. Okay? So the way I can think of this problem, basically, well, an M3U is just a list of strings. Right? As long as I can build a function that takes a list of file names, I can make you a playlist. If the Zune playlist called this list media list, then I can add an attribute to my file list parameter saying media list. Yay, I work with Zune. Again, just like James Gunn. Um, if I wanted to take it with the iTunes equivalent, let's say song list. Same problem. I can have multiple aliases for a parameter and pipe multiple different types of things into it. And this is really, really, really helpful. Um, again, I'm not sure how much time we'll have total, but one of the other places it really tends to help is the problem space I call whose idea is it anyway? Uh, who has dealt with at least one API that just returns back a property called ID? Could it tell you what kind of ID, please? Now, who has developed a PowerShell function that wants to take some of those other property IDs and pipe them in and work cleanly? Less hands, but how well did that go for you? Because the answer tends to be not well 
because everything gave an ID. So if I have just a parameter named ID, everything will bind to it. But if I have a parameter named container ID, and I create an alias property, see I told you I can project, create an alias pop property uh, that will take my ID on a container and create a container ID property on that same object, then only the containers bind to that. So value from pipeline by property name is great for helping to solve the whose ID is in any way problem. The other part you need is types, which we'll come back to shortly. The other big or that you get from value by name is an expression that provides the value. And this is underknown but overpowered. You can literally just pipe in whatever object to a command that has a value from pipeline by parameter in it, or property name function or parameter, and provide a little script block that will compute the value you want to pass in out of, at least in theory, the input object, but you don't have to. Like you can make this just provide a random value from a list for all that anybody cares. <coughs> so that's the official way to do it. This is the unofficial way to do it. Input trickery. Highly parameterized pipelines are great, but sometimes we want or need the real objects. And you can't use them in a freeform function. Like we just established that. If I want to be able to have completely freeform input, I cannot have normal pipeline input. Sorry. Inside of a process block, the very top of a process block, dollar under bar, will always be the current piped in object. Um, now, dollar under bar is one of what I call a number, or one of a number of what I call wet fish variables, which is to say you gotta catch it as quickly as you can, and it is like trying to catch a wet fish with your bare hands. Otherwise, not going to go very well. Uh, so you want to assign this basically at the top of any function that intends to use it. But this can be valuable if you wanted to say, bind five different properties, but only if it was from this object. Or if you're binding from a script block, do something extra and fun. By being able to get access to the real object, even beyond the parameters that are bound, you can do additional trickery based off of it. So this is just good to know. Again, until something goes and overwrites it, which will happen anytime you do any piping inside of your own scripts. So please assign dollar under bar quickly before you can't. Now, dollar input is more and less interesting. Show of hands, who has heard of dollar input, seen dollar input in the past? Okay, that's very surprising. <laughs> to repeat the question, who, who shot themselves in the foot that way? Yeah, or paraphrase it. Um, input's nice, except for the fact that you can't have a parameter named input. That kind of stinks. Input is ancient, like PowerShell v1. And it is the input to the block at that point. Believe it or not, it is an even wetter fish than dollar under bar. We'll get back to that in a second. But in end, dollar input has every input. I recently made a little function just to kind of send a large signal. I've tried piping a million items to it. And when I had a process block accumulating those million items, no matter how I was accumulating, it took about five to 50 times longer than just looking at input once in the end and getting all million items like that. So it's good to know that all our input exists. Unless you're building a free form function, you should almost never use it. If you are building a free form or incredibly high perf function, it may be your best friend. But while it is much faster than accumulating in process, 
it can only be read once. So unlike dollar render bar where you could like assign it to five or six different variables at the top of your script before you did some more piping and it got unset. As soon as you look at dollar input, it ceases to be, basically. So watch out. But if you want to read a million items real quick, input's actually kind of great. Um, so to kind of touch back on this, do we get why alias happiness is good in a parameter? Do we get how we can work our way out of more complicated situations with dollar under bar and dollar input? Or work our way into more complicated situations if you decide to make that painful choice? Quick question on aliases. Yes. You have 10 aliases defined to a variable. Mm hmm. Uh, no, I'm very sorry. Six of one, half dozen of the other. Okay. If you, you're able to use pipeline by property name, mm -hmm. any of those. So if you've got a CSV file, you're doing an import CSV from, and you have any of those columns, name, any one of those, it'll read them. That's correct. And if you had five different CSVs of slightly different formats, great way to normalize them. Your question. No, that, that was a question. Just is, does it accept every single one of them? I, I wasn't aware that an alias would do that. Would, would read. It will accept every single one of them, and at least if I recall correctly, slash in the implementations that do similar things that I build, it'll do it in order. So if it's the main name, yay, otherwise alias one, alias two, alias three, alias four, or so on and so forth until. <laughs> But it will only match one at a time. So if you have an object that has that matches four of those, you're gonna get the first one. That does make sense. Now how does it decide which one first? Oh you okay, if you have multiple objects coming in, whichever one yeah. is first, it's gonna use that for all of the subsequent objects. No. It it will use whichever one it can find first on each of the objects. But the order that they were written in. So, yeah. and so like if you put alias and you say name, first name, last name, mm -hmm. then if the object has a name, it's gonna use that. If the object has a first name and no name, it's gonna use first name. Okay, yeah, because it's in that order. The order it's coded into your friend's yeah. yeah, and that is handy and good to know. Um, what it also helps to be able to do is to look at that current object because you might want to be able to provide that extra clarification for that ambiguity. Like, actually, what you brought up is a pretty good example. Imagine I had a bunch of data from CSVs, a bunch of data from JSONs, and a bunch of data from XML. Each of those objects are going to look slightly differently to PowerShell, and while they're all going to be able to bind, knowing which type it might be might give me a different way to treat it. Like, the CSV is not going to necessarily um, always put the parameters the way I would want. Like, I can't have a script block parameter in either a CSV or a JSON. I could have one in a CLI XML. Is this kind of sort of making sense? Cool. One related cool thing, though, because this is a very useful scenario for value from pipeline by property name and most organizations. If you want to type the data in a CSV, one of your easiest paths is just make a PowerShell function that takes each of those parameter names and assigns it a type. Your CSV will naturally return all the data as strings, because it doesn't know any better. But if you have a PowerShell function that all it does is take this back to the next slide here, takes a bunch of pipeline inputs and turns them into a property bag, then you just take your CSV, pipe it into that, get a bunch of strongly typed property bags out. The thing that the function said should be a date time or an int or a bool, well, that'll automatically coerce the value in the CSV to it because PowerShell is a very tight promiscuous language. Who else knows that terminology? All right, I want to explain it then. Who else has been burned by that behavior? Okay, 
I want to ask that question again after I explain it, and we're going to see a lot more hands go up. Type promiscuity, random sidetrack, is a language design concept that refers to how easily it will coerce or convert types. Like, if a function wants an int and you gave me a string, a type promiscuous language will try to make a string into an int. A, I think sometimes called type conservative language, uh, will not. It will just yell at you, I can't do this because it's a string, not an int. PowerShell is a bit beyond normal type promiscuity because normally type promiscuity is kind of a bit one and done. Uh, all right, I can cast this object or not. PowerShell will go through a few different potential hops of trying to convert one object to into another. And so um, I would say it's a bit more um, not safe for work than your average type promiscuous language, uh, at least from a type promiscuity perspective. From an actual safety for work, please use PowerShell. All of our careers depend on it. Anyway, back to more useful epiphanies and attach stuff to this gentleman's point. Parameters are property bags. Your parameters are a property bag implicitly. To make objects, just use PS custom object, parentheses, ordered, empty hash table, plus PS bound parameters. And that's being a little bit tricky or picky. You can do hash table plus PS bound parameters. You can even make a custom object out of PS bound parameters directly. Just don't. Uh, you might want to change PS bound parameters. You might want that to stay intact. And uh, if you just create a random hash table, the order won't be what you expect. So this quick, easy, copy pasteable, memorable, basically add the hash table of PS bound parameters to whatever you have. The only got you is that does not have default parameters. This is annoying. Maybe someday we will be able to get the team to change that behavior or augment the ecosystem. But to decorate as you go, decoration is a topic we're going to talk about more, but it's basically how you give formatting our types to a given command or property bag. You can just go ahead and say empty hash table with a single PS type name property plus PS bound parameters. Yay! I've got my input parameters and I've turn them into something that I can format and type, all in one line. Like, a lot of functions are actually that simple. The better you are at your job, the dumber your functions will end up being. <coughs> you can simply export or convert these, or these parameters at any point. So a really common scenario is writing a RESTful function where I just really want to expose everything at that endpoint, all of its query parameters and body parameters in PowerShell. Well, let's start with the easiest scenario. Imagine they're all query parameters. Great, cool, just you know, turn them into a query string and I'm done. Walk through my parameter list, join them my ampersands in code, all done, okay? Imagine that it's a JSON body, cool. Convert that body into JSON, all done. Imagine we want to create a consolidated CSV for our boss or for analytics. Cool, you know, we'll accumulate all the input or we'll just use dollar input and end and we'll pipe it to export CSV. Done. All happy, all good, loving it. There's a couple more things that you can do with this, but I'm trying to figure out if they're worth talking about here at this point. Yeah, deferring is definitely worth it. This can be great for taking the input that you have and running it later. We already highlighted that your CSV can be used with a bunch of value from pipeline by property name parameters to run something. If you took those same parameters and you save them back into a CSV and you put them back into your function again, congratulations, you've deferred your input. So any function can basically 
take a series of pipeline parameter input, then take any object of that shape at any time to run it. And if you wanted to say run it later, well, just return back those objects. Your property bag can also be sent as an event. So show of hands here, who knows about PowerShell events at all? Okay, about what I'd expect. Since PowerShell v2, PowerShell has had the ability to send events. You can either register object or engine event to subscribe to an event, or you can get event to get events that weren't handled. This means that instead of the normal six or seven output streams that you think you have in PowerShell, you actually have an infinite number. Because you can just send events to any given channel, any given source identifier. So I could say something like new event dash source identifier, my command dash, me dash message data, basically my parameters, either PS bound parameters or the object copy of it. And by doing that, I can not only defer what I'm going to run, but I can log it and distribute it. I can obviously also send multiple events from within a command. So sometimes I'll basically say, hey, top of a command, here is my event I'm going to be running. Bottom of a command, here is my event I ran, here was my output. Now not only do I have a command that I give you in a module, but that command populates long-term history and produces events that other people could hook. So you could go and say, I want my function to run as soon as your function is done. All I need to do to do that is write one or two lines of code inside of the function, just propagating my data forward. Because events are great. And they've been there for a decade and a half, and that then people know about them and use them. They're wonderful things. They're a wonderful aspect of PowerShell that does not get enough love. And I wish I had more time in this particular talk. Yes, sir. Just to clarify, so the events, uh, those are being stored in memory, correct? Or where is the queuing system for those events? And also, just to clarify, because people are all raise their hands, these aren't event logs, right? These are event messages. Just to clarify, yes, they are in memory. Um, also, they can be forwarded remotely, which is kind of cool. So you can uh, use events to do something like have a computer waiting for UDP messages and sending them back as they arrive to a central server. Um, but no, they are not event logs. This works on Linux too, I promise. Yeah, like it is no longer, in fact, I don't think I've used the term Windows PowerShell in a presentation or in business in years, aside from the very explicit delineation. No, no, you're, you're not loading Windows PowerShell, you're loading PowerShell Core. But I, I'm assuming you're a PowerShell Core user at this point. If you're not, please start. Water's warm, jump in. <coughs> but anyway, if I treat, my parameters as property bags and my property bags as events, then I can have other things respond to that event. Or I can build rich logging based off of that event. This is helpful. I'm regretting this a little bit now because I don't think we actually have time to go through it. And you're not going to be taking notes, so this one we might get to skip. And I'm not gonna make a simple note-taking function, but what I will do real quick just in keeping with the spirit of our foo module here, is I'm gonna go ahead and add some parameters to this real quick. And I'm gonna make this a PSPS1. And we're gonna do the VBN foo VBN bar. I'm gonna make one important point about value by name parameters. They have to be typed for value by name to work. It's fine to have them be an open type like PS object. They just have to have a type. If you do not specify a type, even though PowerShell will default at being a PS object, it will not be able to do the value from pipeline by property name binding. So, updating this code later. Let's go ahead and rebuild our get bar function here. 
Gerber. Uh, BPS is a alias to export TypeScript or build TypeScript. So just saving myself some time. Again, don't worry, be alias happy. It's also alias to PSC because TypeScript is similar enough to TypeScript and enough people got confused and interested. Why wasn't this alias there? Well, I don't know, customer, you'll be right. So if we go look at get bar now, oh, I'm not actually outputting anything from it, let's fix that. Bar one, bar none, foo. No complaints there, let's go ahead and add some stuff to our process block. I don't actually want to output the event, so I'm just going to say new event source identifier, my invocation, invocation name. Why bother typing it each time? My invocation, invocation name, as it kind of implies, it's what I'm called. It's just a long way to write it. And message data here is going to be ordered plus PS bound parameters, okay? And we're also gonna do the same thing here. But we're gonna actually return this one as a PS custom object. And be annoyed at VS code for the way it tries to do that. There and there. Okay. Rebuild that file. <laughs> we can see I get a lot more typing there than I cared to type personally. And I've got everything back out the other end. So let's go ahead and get bar on foo. Cool, and get event. Maybe get my caps lock turned off too. Looks like I've got a few events already. Just a few, just a tad. Uh, so let's get event, source identifier, get bar. There we go. Oh, I guess I didn't know the bonus points, but you can all see them on the screen, right? So when I have 500 objects output from the object pipeline, what don't I know? Who said it? The time. What else don't I know? Really, whether you're object output or console output or error out, I, if I merge all the streams, I'll at least be able to look at the type and tell it apart, and I would get them in the right order, but if I look at all the other streams in different orders, okay, so there were these five errors that happened and these 500 outputs, which of these errors paired to which of these outputs? So when I have an output, I don't actually have a sense of where that output sits in, well, its own output stream. It's an individual piece of output. When I have an event, I can look at events before or after it. I can also look at the run space ID or computer name the event comes from. I can have whole monitoring systems built on top of events if I want. But I don't have time for that today. I don't have time to get into much more than continuing to charge on through. This is just a taste of what you can do with parameter metadata. And while it is not a function that saves your notes, you kind of get how it could be, right? Like, it does not care. It's just taking your parameters and doing stuff with them. Let's do one more for good measure. Let's take this here and export CSV. Uh, I'm gonna join path, PS script root, which is where this is located, and my dot 
CSV, because I'm uncreative. Rebuild our file one more time. And reimport and get our foo again and get child item. Okay, demo gods were cruel, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, I think it's the different question did I save? But thank you for asking. No, actually, I did the other thing that I often do. Do you guys catch it? Yeah. This is the good and bad about having compiled files and their output. You will find you debug in their output files. Sometimes you forget to propagate those changes to their main files when you're done. Thank you. Rule of three is here. Depending on how real time you wanted it to be, yes. Register engine event, source identifier, whatever your choice would do it as soon as they arrive. You might also want to say like every X number of seconds or minutes, go grab the last minute's worth of logs. It's really how important is that critical failure moment? And how bad is your other logging around it compared to how much you want to overload the system and how much is flooding through it? You know. Okay, let's try our get bar one more time. Yay, we got a CSV this time. And we're gonna go ahead and be a little bit cheeky. And we're gonna go ahead and make foo here three. And back through the round trip we'll go. So if this were a thing to store your notes, so what? You're just loading an object and saving an object and loading an object and saving an object. And that is truthfully, if you think about it correctly, just loading and saving a bunch of properties or loading and saving a bunch of parameters, or loading and saving a property bag. That's what you need to compare with what if, where you run what if at one time, you grab your property bag, on Thursday in production, you run the same parameters you ran what if on for your dry run. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like, in mission critical stuff, running what if first once or twice is never a bad idea. And, using like past what if results as a good baseline is also not a bad idea. But ideally, you can also kind of rinse and repeat the cycle if what if is just returning its property bag to be like this object that it hasn't yet actually done anything with, then you should be able to take the what if result and pipe it back into the command without the what if. There's lots of piping fun you can have. I cannot possibly teach all of it to you in a day, but I can give you a lot of the high level ideas here. And also be amazed at how quickly time has flown. Told you we weren't gonna finish. Uh, I have talked about compiling commands though a bunch so I can blast right through this slide. Uh, we have talked a little bit about saving time and complexity. I haven't talked that much about metaprogramming. I did point at PSSVG, but let me kind of come back to this one. If there is a schema, why write your commands by hand? If all of what I just showed you is basically rote, why write any of it? Why should you, why should I? If I can turn something into metadata, I can make a command. How? New PipeScript in PipeScript. Basically, we'll take all the metadata you've already been seeing, has parameters for every single one of them, and it lets you recreate parameters and scripts. 
So two modules that use the living crap out of this are PSSVG and OBS PowerShell. Uh, PSSVG, we already did a brief, you know, picture speak a thousand words demo, but it basically has one single build PS1 file that just goes to look at MDN, clones the repository, scrapes the files, figures out what bits of the markdown actually attach to each attribute, and gives me a property bag. And with that property bag, I can turn you into commandlets. With OBS PowerShell, I got even luckier, although not as lucky as it can be. They have a protocol.json describing their WebSocket. So all I really needed to do was write a couple of core commands that work with their WebSocket, and then a bunch of metaprogramming that goes, looks at that document, and turns them into commandlet shapes, renaming where appropriate, et cetera, to make it good PowerShell. This is the way to go. I mean, like, there's no other real way to say it. If, if I did either of these any other way, what I've basically signed up for is a hell of technical debt. Do you want to write code that keeps up with what a bloody web standard is? Do you want to write that by hand each time? You know, do you want to handcraft that or do you want like the loom, the super loom to come along and make it all happen for you? In a lot easier turf, uh, there are two protocols in, open, in PowerShell, or sorry, in TypeScript that open up a lot of doors. Uh, one of them is the open API protocol. Uh, protocols in PypeScript allow you to use URLs as real commands, so you can basically create a wrapper for any open API just by pointing to the URL. And you can also do that for any JSON schema. Um, and I mean, that's not everything, but it's respectably close enough. Like a fairer portion of our modern technical world can be described in those ways. And as more and more areas of the tech world basically get turned into property bags, those same property bags will get to go wash back through PowerShell and come back out the other side. So if I can describe, here are the five lines of PowerShell that wrap Python and pass your arguments correctly. And I can turn your Python class into a bunch of metadata, then having a PowerShell wrapper on that entire Python class becomes very cheap instead of spending so much time at the grindstone behind you know, the loom or whatever metaphor I'm using today, you know, working myself to the bone. Yeah, these are our old, at this point, hands. But I haven't actually made them crack and bleed since my 20s because I work smarter, not harder. One other quick point here is conditional compilation is especially nice. This is a very new feature in TypeScript. Remember how I said validate pattern can mean anything we want in a script? Well, if I have a commit message, validate pattern on top of a PSPS1 will tell me, hey, compile this file if it matches that commit message. Otherwise, skip it. So if I have a massive code base and I want to only pick three or four things to compile on this you know, particular check-in, conditional compilation. Just use a validate pattern on top of your script. You want me to show real quick? Because it's going to complain, or actually it's going to not complain in this one because it doesn't have a repository. But it will complain if I move it. So if I put validate pattern here, blah, 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 above a param block, Okay, not going to complain because there's not a Git repository there, but it will still build it. If I go to copy this into another directory, get bar, uh, get dash bar, not PSPS1, over into, oh, I'm going to pick on uGit. So if I go into uGit here, Okay, do I, oh, it's the lack of Windows PowerShell folder, which is where most of these things are, the actual PowerShell folder. Sorry for a quick second. 
Uh, Git clone. You'll work. I don't care. So if I go into this directory here and I take my thing here over into that PS metrics, which is a Git repository, and I go try to build it. Now, still need to actually be in the right directory here. This is why demos live can kind of suck. Okay, and build that. And it should be like, no, I won't. Or the demo gods can be mean to me. Or it could take so bloody long contact to get a repository that I'll feel even worse about doing this demo at all. Demo gods can be mean. Um, I do not particularly care about what is causing this right now. You get the high level point of what this is trying to accomplish. It's mostly going to be compiling this in a GitHub action with you not thinking about it anyway. So let's keep charging on. We'll come back to that if we can. Uh, inheritance is also nice. I'm going to go pop over to PSSVG for a second and look at that in practice. So we've got all these commands that come from the standard. These ones were all written basically through metaprogramming all this not written by hand. Thank God. Thank God. Hey, what can I say? Those people at the W3C are pretty exhaustive. <laughs> Obviously, I don't want to dem or have all this code in every other piece that needs it, right? So if I have a custom shape here, like a convex polygon, first of all, don't worry, be alias happy. Why should I have 50 different commands for different number of polygons? Why not just have all the aliases that describe all the different polygons with a fixed number of points? And a parameter for side count. Alias happy up here, too. Note that I've got this bit up here, though, that's saying inherit from SVG path. And exclude the parameter D. This is your PSPS1. I got that, and then I got the shape name, which you know can map to its alias. So there's several different ways you can provide the same piece of information. Then numerically, all it needs is these four pieces of information. How much am I rotating the polygon? What's my center X? What's my center Y? What's my radius? Okay. This generates this code. Now, I could generate all of that mile and a half of parameters each time. That would be one form of inheritance. That's static inheritance. You can also dynamically inherit, which is what this version is doing. And it's basically saying, go get me this path or command. Go read all of its parameters. Go expose them as dynamic parameters and return them, except for this one D. That's it. And again, the code's going to look the same every time. Why should you write it? Hell, why should I keep writing it? I write it once. My compiler writes it for me from then on. So inheritance is nice. It lets me have something like this in that amount of code instead of, well, a crap load more. And if we go back to the root of the project and our examples, I'm just going to go find Polygon because I don't want to look all these that might have gone too far there. But yeah, uh, stars is a variation of them, and then there's these ones, repeated shapes. So this script is literally just don't go take these extra parameters, go make a shape with that many sides this many times. And at each additional step, I'm not having to specify the thousand and one additional things you can do here. You still can. I'm just passing those thousand and one parameters down for you. Yay. That's the joy of inheritance. You don't have to write your big command by hand. Just add inherit above a script block. Let pipe script do the rest. 
So that is the end of our function section. Uh, checking on some certain epiphanies here. Do we all get that functions are very flexible now? Like, hopefully, with your understandings of free form functions, dollar input and dollar underbar, and all the crap you just learned about value from pipeline. Are PowerShell functions more flexible than they thought you were and you walked in this door today? Have you learned a few new ways that you can push interesting things through the pipeline? Cool. Again, advanced functions can bind any specific sort of objects and freeform functions can bind absolutely anything. Attribution is amazing. Adds a lot of richness to PowerShell functions and parameters. Metadata matters, makes your function easier to discover, and it can be used as a handshake. We didn't really get that far into this one, but I can basically say flipping around and away from like a validate script or a validate pattern approach. Um, let's go back to our perpetual gumshoe example. I could say that gumshoe will export to anything that has a parameter or property indicating that it is a gumshoe to exporter. I could say, you have a reflection assembly metadata info that says you're related to gumshoe. I can make my own relationships with attributes or with parameters, and I can use this to easily handshake with other scripts other people write. So if you're in a medium-sized team that has some PowerShell gurus and some people that can kind of barely string together a script, well, make it easy for the people that can barely string together a script and write a really simplified form and then just build a bridge from it. Just say, okay, write the script you already had and put this attribute on it and put that there and maybe name it this way, maybe just hand it to me and I'll check it in for you. You don't have to care. Functions parameters can be property bags and this is kind of overpowered itself because while functions are already objects, this allows you to defer your uses of that object and transform a variety of different objects into a common form. Functions and attributes can also be seen as property bags. I have a lot of metadata in PowerShell. There are many reasons I come back to loving this language, but that is a big one of them. Tell me another language that has more metadata on the point of utilization than PowerShell. Also, compiling commands are cool. So that show hands who gets a little bit more why they want to, would want to compile commands now. We're making progress. It can save time, it can be more productive. Uh, speaking of time, I'm not sure how much we officially have left. I guess whenever that group shuts up, I'll have some sense. 45 minutes. Oh. Then we might have some more time. Good. So now we get to go to the possibly most esoteric section. Possibly. Pseudotypes. Making objects out of anything. And making them useful. So we've already kind of seen property bag can just become an object. Right? And any... CSV can be piped into any function, become a property bag, become an object. Any JSON is basically already a property bag, already an object. Those are great. Problem is, those are almost a little too anonymous. The benefit is those sorts of things are lighter. If you have a DLL with a hundred very specific classes that's not necessarily as helpful as just being able to handle an open-ended property bag and decorate it. So any object will do. Strong types are fine. They are just not needed. This is controversial hot take territory. Um, definitely one person's opinion. But I am not a big fan of deeply strongly typing your functions. Going back to that type promiscuity or not sort of question, you can write a parameter for a function that takes a very specific .NET type. 
And that might create a very awkward experience. Uh, in fact, I'm trying to think if there's a Microsoft team of years past that I could call out for this that would be a good example or a non-Microsoft one. If anybody in the room has an example where they run into overly strongly typed parameters that are impossible to use on the cli. No? I'll just say, I was at a university and I made an ADO system for you know, all voice and stuff, and we struggled with typing the user name for like the AV property. So in order to you know, just pass a CSV into it, you have to like, kind of throw a, like, making an AD object PowerShell to like populate with the user and pass it as well. Yeah, I mean, also a kind of fantastic example of where this fails in practice. When you're using a strongly type, it's like a really strongly constructed hoop. You will jump through this exact hoop of this exact size with no margin of error. Why? I can cast a larger net. I can take a set of property bags that will be better for me. Uh, or a set of simple properties. I tend to keep most parameters, if I can, to string, int, float, or number, basically, switch, date time, time span, and if none of those fit, PS object or dictionary. Constrains what I have to deal with. And most of those types are so broadly supported and reconstructable that basically any CSV will do. So I love writing parameters that way and writing things that way and having dumb enough objects work that way is great. If you are going to go take your strongly typed system and load up a bunch of JSON from, into that system, you're going to take a performance hit. Not a big one, but you're basically taking the, the time hit to figure out how perfectly you can go through that hoop. You don't need to. If, I'm, if my main goal here is loading up like the data from a JSON file and giving it back in an accessible way, having a real type does not help that goal. It just means I type more. Casting takes time. Luckily, PowerShell has this whole extended type system. It is so overpowered. So overpowered. All PS objects are extensible. And in case you weren't aware, almost everything in PowerShell is a PS object. Like, it's kind of hard to not be working with PS objects. You have to try. So we can just decorate. What do I mean by that? Decoration is a term for a technique. I've already mentioned it a couple times, but it's manipulating an object's PS type names. All objects have dot ps object, which is their ps object's member information, and dot ps type names, which is the list of type names they have. Note the plural. Not type name, type names. Any object can be decorated to extend it. This can give it new properties and methods. If I declare extended types or properties, and I say that you are this object, you get them. Or, you know, on how it looks. We'll get back to this later. Ah, sorry, my punchline is a few slides or bits ahead. Type decoration is overpowered. Let's talk about shape shifting objects and then we'll get back to my punchline. By changing type names, we shape shift. We hit typos in presentation and feel compelled to change them at a moment's notice. Sorry. At least I remember which button is resume slides. I've seen somebody do that. Sorry for being the guinea pigs here. There we go. Now you just magically went second screen again. So by changing type names, we shave shift. This gives us multiple dynamic inheritance. Well, was the correct response to that, unless you like, you know, are a big CS nerd. But this is something almost no other language can do. 
Technically, this is called dynamic polymorphism, but let's just admit it. That's like a, somebody with the CSPHD's way of saying shape shifting, right? So, punchline time. Put simply, in PowerShell, you're a duck if I say you're a duck. I give no ducks. You will quack. Objects can also change themselves. Like, I can have a method that says, go become a duck. And it will make the object become a duck. Script properties and script methods can change the object. Now, both of them, being able to change the object is especially broken. Can anybody already see why? Uh, no, I couldn't quite hear you either, but uh, the short, fun answer is because when you first look at an object, you enumerate its properties. If I don't have a way to format an object, it will look at its properties, which can then change the object to tell you how it should be formatted in the future. So you can basically have objects that hydrate on first use. Nuts, right? Does anybody know of another programming language that is an easy thing? Pepsi challenge for the day. You can change the object in many ways. You can add new additional properties, but yes, you can also obviously change the type line. Okay, you're a duck until I look at you, and then I can make a guess at what type you are. Like whether you're a mallard or I don't know, I'm not that much of a duck fiend. But don't be daunted about all this stuff. It sounds super complicated, right? Like, oh crap, so how do I do all of this? Well, it's easy. This is actually the first time we're really gonna get deep into another one of the tools past PipeScript. I don't think we got that deep on PipeScript. But easy out is old. It's very old and very useful. It is arguably the oldest module. It was written originally as like a test package when they were called packages. And its whole purpose is to write types and format PS1 files. Because those are scary. Those are really scary, annoying XML that nobody should have to write by hand. And I'm sorry for anybody who has. Also, that includes me. I am really sorry for all the time of my life that has been sucked into learning how to master these areas. PowerShell. Types, PS1 XML uh, files extend objects in PowerShell. Format, PS1 XML extend formatters. Easy Out was originally built more in a formatter emphasis and still has a very strong presence there. It's only in the last five or six years that I've started to realize just how overpowered the extended type system is. And I expect that over time that will become more and more of its emphasis. Any module can load them. To recap, all you gotta do is put the two pieces of magic metadata in. You can do dot types to process or dot formats to process and update type data or update format data respectively. Uh, update type data will uh, be able to load the types at different points or force their loading if they had already been loaded. Uh, types to process can, I guess the quick way to put this is be stomped. So if you have uh, types that you're exporting from a given module that does not prevent another module from coming along and creating problems for you by exporting the same types. Easy out can be used locally or in a GitHub action. Um, Really not that hard one way or the other. Let's see how easy the structure is. So any folder can be the root. It's usually slash types. Any file in that root applies to every type. Any files in subdirectory apply to all types beneath those subdirectories. PS type name dot text can set the type name. It will be inferred from the directory name. Get or set underscore some file dot ps1 would make script properties. In that case, get or set some file, literally, 
might want to give it a better name than that. But some file would make a script method. Again, called some file, you might want to give it a better name than that. Except for start at format ps1, start at view.ps1, and start at class.ps1, which are all hopefully mostly self-evident. Format and views are formatting slash views, the type side or formatting side of things. And class ps1 files just seemed like kind of the right thing to do. I'm declaring a directory full of types. Why couldn't you include a class in that directory? Should that be included in your types file where it would cause problems? Not exactly, so here we are. Uh, other files will become note properties, mostly. Uh, if you like try to put an MP3 into a easy out file, it'll become a script property. You guys thought for a second I was gonna say I wouldn't do anything with it, right? But no, it's just like, you have files in a directory, that's gonna become your types files. So let's shapeshift. Build a quick demonstration. Back off the beaten path here. Not gonna make the same mistake twice though, so. Here we go. Uh, so let's make a switch shape. Dot PS1. I'll go with PS PS1. Function. Ah. Switch shape. And we're going to give this a value by name of new shape. Our shape name. I'm not overthinking this. So I'm just trying to quickly write. And we're going to give another value by our value from pipeline of shape object. Lazy little function as it'll be. We're going to go ahead and say decorate. Uh, actually, I'll do this the old fashioned way for a second. And I'll say if there's a shape object and shape name, let's take a string array here. Then shape object for each shape name of shape and shape name shape object ps type names and name of shape and I'm gonna check that it doesn't already have it so I don't keep adding it to not contains name of shape. Don't at me on relative performance of this function. I'm writing it quickly. Okay. Simple. All this function does is shapeshift the object. Okay. Uh, I think we're good here. I guess I would want to probably also say output the shape of the object. Okay. Uh, it'll probably be nicer for value from pipeline, but you, let's do that anyway, rather than risk the demo god curse. Okay, so let's switch shape. Build that file. And then we're going to start building some individual type directories. Okay, so we're going to make dir types. And I'm going to be a little bit lazy here and I'm going to write easy format file because, you know, there's always things that can help you save time. Uh, write easy format file. We're going to call this foo bar modules format file. There we go. This will spit out the code for you to have your own easy out integration. So I'm going to go set content here to foo bar module dot easy out dot ps1. I can type, and we're going to import. Actually, we already have easy out clearly because that just ran. So foobar module here. 
right now, there's nothing in type, so it's not outputting. Okay, we're gonna create a new folder and we're gonna call it uh, dog. And another new folder and we're gonna call it cat. Okay, and you know, because the example, duck. Okay, and meow.ps1. I'm getting real lazy with these ones, I don't mind. Also, I feel like I'm kind of making a kid's game right now. What sound does the dog make? Okay, so we've got a duck with a quack method here. A cat with a meow method, dog with a wolf method. Okay, I had a specific example I had in mind before this, but let's, uh, let's rebuild our easy out. And now we have our types ps1 XML file. Look at all this code we didn't have to write. I mean, it's not too much, but still. Better than doing it all by hand. It's a hell of a lot easier to sort and discover than trying to edit your PowerShell inside of an XML file. If you want to do that to yourself, you have fun. Um, being I think a little less topical, but still more pop culture relevant. Let's go, man. Uh, porn. Man, new folder, bear. And pick. Uh, yeah, at least one person sees where I'm going. Okay, so we've made a whole bunch of animal types. Yay. Let's go change our PSD1 real quick. I bet you you're still really empty. Yeah, you are. Told you. Okay, cool. Ah. Cool. Now, sh which shape? Let's start with OBJ here. Good old empty property bag. PS custom object of this. Doesn't have any type names yet, doesn't have any data. Uh, if I get member it, next to nothing. PS type names, add. Cool, that's still there. So, man. Bear. And pick. Man bear pug actually sounds way more entertaining to me personally, but maybe next presentation. Um, but yeah, you can see as I'm adding additional memories, or mem like type names here, I'm getting additional members on the object. And I can go in reverse, I can clear out the type names. And then we're back to nothing. Is this whole shape-shifting objects thing making a little bit more sense now? Anybody have another programming language they can name that can shape-shift objects, period, let alone this easily? Does everybody agree that shape-shifting objects both sounds cooler and explains the concept more than dynamic polymorphism? <laughs> yeah. I really, really do love nerdery and I do love the dev side of me, but there are certain times where it's like, do you not understand that not a single ops engineer wants your PhD term? Stop calling it that. Sorry, this rant over. Cool, so now we've shape-shifted. 
And I think it's time to try to switch the monitor back again for a second. Yes. So, anything can be decorated. Just add PS type names. No, actually. No, actually, but but it's a good question. Uh, you can also have a thing in um, types files called selection sets, and that's what, or in format files called selection sets. You don't have a selection set in a types file. So in the case of get child item, while technically it could be a shape-shifting object, and they are welcome to do that, the way that you actually have it working is by a formatter that has a selection set that says, I will either format files or folders. But it is a very good question because of the little subtle differences there. And we're gonna get into formatters hopefully in the next second. We so said we have till five? All right, we are currently in. 43 out of 64 slides. <laughs> so yeah, go on. A bit better. So just change the PS type names if you want to shape shift. Um, pseudo types can be helpful. I hope you can already get some sense of this, but like taking it back to the CSV example, if I wanted to some three different properties of CSV and push them into a fourth great case for having a script method and just decorate the object and call the method and you're done because that method can it doesn't even have to return a value it can change its own object and start adding the fourth column again I'm still only five or six years down the Oh, maybe types really are the huge answer to all of the things in PowerShell Road. But types are very, very overpowered. They offer incredibly unique capabilities. Also, pseudotyping is easy. Really, like, if you walked up to this directory, that oh, is not on my screen at current. If you walked up to that directory, would you have trouble Guessing what the fuck is going on? Excuse me, there. We got, now we're PG-13. <laughs> Couple more and we'll be at R. Ideally, code is self-evident. Ideally. This gets harder and harder the more code you have. But at any given little point, code should be as self-evident as you can make it. There's a famous quote by Sun Tzu that I was meaning to bring up way earlier in this. This is what I'm trying to do today and what I try to do overall. That is that a general should be able to lead his army as if he were leading a single man through a canyon by the hand. Now, you should be able to engage individually in logical and understandable ways in a way that shouldn't be too dependent on somebody's skill set And if you build your PowerShell right, even though you're building lots of magic, you should be able to look at each little part of the magic and it should make a fair degree of sense. That's the hope. That's the dream. It's not always accomplished, myself included. But that's what you're going for. So pseudotyping is easy. Just use easy out. Now, the formatting side. It's gonna be way quicker because I already give talks about formatting, and we already talked about types, which make this a lot easier to understand. Don't even really have to cover the general folder structure because it is the same, but format or view files beneath formatting, views, or types will be considered a format or source. I honestly don't actually tend to have a formatting or views subfolder in most of my modules. At this point, it's just logically simpler to put them all underneath types, including your formatter right next to all the other stuff about your type. 
Also, it's a hell of a lot easier than looking through like 50 different C sharp files for exactly which five line record you had. More maintainable too. All right, format view will write a formatter. Dash property will make it a table formatter. Dash as list would make it a list formatter. Action will make it a custom formatter. I do not care about wide formatters and I never will because wide formatters don't care about themselves. Terrible inside joke for anybody who's ever dealt with a wide formatter in PowerShell. Formatting can be grouped. There are four parameters on right format view that'll help. Dash group by property will group by one or more properties. Group by script, group on a given script. Group label will be the grouping label. And group action will be the grouping control. Like what bunch of code should run at the top of each thing. Um, I suppose I can probably demonstrate that quickly now. Good table formatting trigger to be aware of is you can use write format view dash style property. And this will allow you to stylize a property, specifically using PS style. So style property will basically be a dictionary of your object path and PS style to this particular thing. So you say name of property equals this style, name of other property equals this style. Go style each of these properties this way. There is also color property, which predates style property by a few years. And that allows rich dual mode output, which means that if you use this, it will make your tables output their columns in a color format that supports both terminal and HTML. If your host.ui.supports HTML is set to true, these will just magically start to do colorized HTML terminal content instead. But otherwise, normal, everyday terminal content. Style property has proven a little bit more popular since it came out. I think they're both valuable. I'm still investing in figuring out what the better pure HTML formatting answer is, but one exists because to recap, everything is an object in PowerShell. Every object can be manipulated in PowerShell. Every object can be formatted and extended in PowerShell. So, there must be a way to do it somehow. There's also a right format view virtual property, which will create basically fake properties to render or change how existing ones get displayed. You probably would not want to do the first. Um, who here has been annoyed by get processes formatter? Okay. Expected a little bit more hands. So you haven't like get processed and then tried to do dot n or dot ws or something like that. It gives you column titles and then it doesn't have them on the real object. This just drives people nuts. Uh, if you have a column header, please try to make it something people can plug into the actual object as well. Otherwise, they might be mad at you. But it's really handy if you wanted to make say a list of three strings just appear separated by multiple lines or otherwise format a property so it displays the way you'd like. Yes? <laughs> Did Steve still do that? Let us take this offline with great vehemence. <laughs> that, um, that would be a less than ideal behavior. Sorry, the old corporate attempts at politeness die hard. Attempts though. Uh, custom formatting. Because, you know, tables weren't quite enough. Custom formatters can do anything. Like I can write a custom format that returns HTML now, same as I could do five years ago, same as I could do 10 years ago, same as I could do the day PowerShell was born. 
or at least the day the types and formatting subsystem was born. It's a little bit annoying that it is somewhat terminal centric, like it doesn't have this sense of like a greater UI or layout in particular, but a custom formatter can run any code you'd like. Custom formatters are written using a series of expressions. You write those with write format view expression. Dash style and color act similarly to tables just on the expression. So write format view expression dash style. We'll go ahead and look up something in PS style and go bracket what you're putting that way. Dash color, we'll go try to make a rich color. Uh, dash script block will render whatever script block inside of that formatter. So it'll run the script block, output the result. Dash property will render the property. Dash text will render flat text. Although you can also render localized resources, that's not where I'm going today. Enumerate will enumerate multiple results and control will let you specify which control you want to use. By the way, you can say write format, view, name, whatever, dash as control to create controls. All controls are custom formatters under the covers, basically. So let's give our shapeshifter some skins. And I'm going to use this module to cheat. This one I wrote a couple of months ago. I was originally writing it for this class and not for killing my neck in this way. Here we go again. Um, but this module was actually written in almost entirely in types files. So uh, there's a data directory that it loads up containing you know, your emoji blocks and what individual characters exist. And that's loaded up inside of the types directory by an eponymous thing. So this variable is exposed automatically when this function is imported. So let's, let's see, git clone, yeah, emoji.git import module there. So let's find emoji pattern dog. I'm going to look for a single word here because I know there are a few more. So, you know, get our dog face there. Dog.format.ps1. Being real basic here. If you don't use write format view expression, it'll basically automatically put that in for whatever you had here. So I'm going to say that this applies to dog. Uh, no, name, type name, dog. Okay. If I were to run this file, it would give me, well, a bunch of XML. Yay, I don't have to write it. And if I go ahead and I rerun our easy out file at this point, I should see both of them. Why am I not seeing both of them? That is a good question. Quite curious. Also, I feel like they get louder when I try to concentrate. Am I wrong? <laughs> um, so yes, I want to go ahead and try to rebuild this. I want to double check that I'm not doing anything stupid here. Yeah, I still have a light bug to fix there and I don't default to presuming that things could be in types. Or at least I don't in the version of easy out I used on this. There we go. Now I have a format file too. Now I can go ahead and load up that format file too. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to do this for all the animals because, you know, time. But 
uh, let's go ahead and do one more at least. Okay, three more. Man. Now, oh. hand.format.ps1. Right, format view. Type thing. You can only have one formatter at a time applying. That kind of stinks. Otherwise, I could write man, bear, pig, the formatter. But as it stands, I have to write an object that has the type name of man, bear, pig for that to adequately apply to both. It will not automatically take all formatters for the object, just the first one it finds going down. But we'll demonstrate that in a second. And bear. I think teddy bear. Add some levity. Okay, and should be easy enough to find a pig. I have no regrets for my typos. And I stand by my supposition that man bear pug would be way more entertaining. Um, All right, so we got our slightly nicer formatters now. And do we still have our object? Yep, we do. Okay, import this. Um, dot ps type names, add. Say what? Thank you. Okay. Because it already had a formatter, it's not going to keep changing them. But if I change up the order, it will have a nice time. Pig, uh, bear, man, pig. Oh, I should actually be able to do this, I think. Type to switch, shape, shape name, dollar under bar, and shape object. Uh, is OBJ, I think. So yeah, did all three of the switches, but it kept displaying it as the first formatter it had, because that's how the formatting subsystem works. If I insert into zero and say you're a pig now. So yes, not only can I shapeshift the object, I can also basically say how the object should present itself. In what other language is this possible? Not like with a bolted on templating engine that the language built five years after it came out. This is ancient arts of PowerShell. This has always worked in PowerShell. We've just never really realized what it could do. Which, you know, a bit of a shame, we're getting there. Okay, so that's the formatting side of things. Let's get back to this guy and see how it readjusts, or if it readjusts. Nope. There we go. Um, again, it looks like I ended up doing the workshops. I guess I'm going to presume that in future workshops, I'm doing all the work. Shucks. Uh, but important formatting epiphanies, anything can be decorated. 
just add PS type names. Now, just like in real life, just because you can decorate everything doesn't mean you should decorate everything. But any object can also have any skin. Just write a formatter. PowerShell objects can shape shift. Just you change the PS type names. And formatting is pretty easy too, thanks to Easy Out. How are you? Oh, two minute morning. Well, I now feel very confident in saying we are not finishing the remaining 14 slides. <laughs> Ready for lightning mount round? Okay, I'm gonna do this like half lawyerly quickly. Perfect publishing, because we wanna be fast. CICD is your friend. It's really, really nice to use a good publishing workflow rather than just try to build it all yourself. And that could be very time consuming and sucky and I could spend another 45 minutes talking about it, but we got two left. So get it done with PS DevOps. Really useful module. I built it about five or six years ago. Uh, it automates all of Azure DevOps and GitHub, but it's real big recurring strength is it give me the ability to write my builds in a bunch of PSD1 files and a bunch of PS1 files. And that makes any pipeline almost copy, paste, and replace. So here's my generic PS DevOps workflow you can steal. You can also literally go to any repository I have. They all have variations of this file. And it's you know, go require PS DevOps, go import steps from either the module or location. Go create a GitHub workflow, given name of thing, name of thing, name of thing, output path. The only thing I have to change for each individual bit is my build instructions for just that job, which also ends up being copy paste. Change the name of the thing and then you know, tweak it a bit. If I want the one-liner form, that's new GitHub workflow, dash name, build whatever on push, dash job, test PowerShell on Linux, tag release and publish, build whatever, output path, yada, yada, yada. The build whatever would be, running rapidly through this, take your screenshots if you'd like, but basically this level of PSD1. So runs on Ubuntu latest if success so that it doesn't always run if previous steps failed, and then check out, and honestly, you can pick which ones you like. I got PSSVG to help me make a logo, I got PipeScript compile a bunch of everything, Easy out and help out. Now, if you had a workflow like this, all that build pipe script, write format view, all that stuff's gonna run every time that you check in without you having to think about it. And by the way, just highlighting one step here, maybe if we can. No, we can't. Um, publish PowerShell module is already there. So like tag release and publish is a well-known step. All I have to do for that every time, any module, just go create a gallery key and set it up as a GitHub secret named gallery key. That is literally all I have to do. Go copy and paste these files, provision myself a gallery key, and I'm publishing in the module another time, another go. And on that, we did rush through like four more of those slides in a couple of minutes, but Yeah, we're not gonna get to talk to this. Come to this or one on third, Tuesday and rocking Docker with PowerShell. We'll be able to get into that more. But I'll leave that up for now, for about half a second. And questions, comments, stop the hook. <laughs>